Well, here we have our capillary, and we notice that blood is entering from the arterial end via an arterial, and we know that once the blood is somewhat deoxygenated, it is exiting via the venous end. And the capillaries are very close to the tissues of the body, so here we have some body cells. Could be any tissue, but there are the body cells there. Now, what we want to look at here is the physiology of the capillaries and tissue fluid. And the first thing to notice are the various pressures that are involved here. Now you do see slightly different figures quoted, but the pressure in the arterioles, because it's come from an artery, is relatively high. It's got the effect of the cardiac contractions propelling the blood through the arterial system. So when the blood comes into the arterial end of the capillary, it's about 35 millimetres of mercury pressure. Then as it goes through, the pressure drops. And by the time we get to the venous end of the capillary, it's down to about 16 millimetres of mercury pressure. Because as we know, the venous system is a lower pressure system than the arterial system. Now in plasma, there are some large plasma proteins. Large plasma protein molecules. As well as the cells and everything else, there's these large plasma proteins. And they are very large. The most common plasma protein is albumin. And that's got a molecular weight of 69,000, so it's a very big molecule. And then there are globulins as well, the immune proteins, even higher molecular weight, 140,000 there molecular weight. And there's a little bit of fibrinogen as well, the clotting protein. And that's even bigger actually, that's 400,000 molecular weight, but that doesn't matter too much. There's all these plasma proteins. The main one is albumin. The albumin contributes actually about 80% of what I'm going to talk about. And what I want to talk about is the combined effect of these plasma proteins is going to generate an osmotic pressure of about 26 millimetres of mercury. <clears throat> now, some people give a slightly higher figure, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll live with that for today. Now, of course, you know that there's lots of water molecules in plasma as well. So there's lots of water molecules. And you'll know that there's other substances in here, such as uh, ions. So there's lots of ions as well. Sodium, potassium, chloride, a little bit of magnesium, a little bit of calcium. Now, <clears throat> the sodium is a very osmotic molecule. So sodium will dramatically attract water. But the point is the sodium can go in and out through these small pores quite easily. Sodium is actually water soluble, it goes in and out through these small pores. So what it means is that the concentration of sodium in the plasma and the concentration of sodium in the tissue fluids is pretty well the same. So there's not a great osmotic difference between these two compartmentalizations of body fluid. The sodium is pretty well the same on both sides, as is the chlorine, as is the potassium. It slightly depends on how you measure it, but we can say it's basically the same. So there's no great osmotic effect because the sodium, the chloride, the potassium, they can fit through these pores, the very small molecules. So the concentrations are roughly the same on either side. So there's no differentiation of ionic concentration that would account for an osmotic gradient. But the plasma proteins, because as we've already said, the albumin has got a molecular weight of 69,000, it's a huge molecule. That can't fit through these gaps, these intercellular clefts. Now, diagrammatically, I've drawn these clefts as being quite big. In reality, the clefts, these gaps, only occupy a one thousandth of the surface area, the internal surface area of the uh, capillary. <clears throat> 
So one thousandth of the surface area of the capillary are these gaps. But that's quite enough to let the sodium in and out and the other ions in and out. <clears throat> but it's not big enough to let the plasma proteins through. So the plasma proteins are going to be retained in the plasma. So these are plasma, let's draw them bigger so we remember, they're big molecules. Now we'll see later that small amounts of plasma protein do escape. They're not really supposed to, but they do. But for now, let, let's just say that these are retained within the plasma, within the um, within the blood, within the intravascular compartment. Now, there is, some people say, uh, slight hydrostatic pressures, fluid pressures in the tissue fluid, but it's way smaller than the hydrostatic pressure here. So what we mean by the hydrostatic pressure is the blood pressure in here is 35 millimetres of mercury. And the pressure of that, the hydrostatic pressure, is the pressure that this 35 millimetres of mercury exerts on the vessel wall. That's the hydrostatic pressure. So sometimes there might be a little bit of opposing hydrostatic pressure here, but it's hard to measure it. So basically we'll count the hydrostatic pressure here as being nothing, as being zero. So what we actually have is here we have 35 millimetres of mercury pushing out. And uh, this osmotic effect here is trying to suck in. So the osmotic effect is trying to suck in. Let's draw arrows that way. So this is trying to suck in. So we can think of these plasma proteins as suction molecules. They're trying to osmotically suck water in. And we've got 26 millimetres of mercury there. So there we've got 35 pushing out. We've got uh, 25 sucking back in. So that gives us a net filtration pressure of nine millimetres of mercury. So can you see that? There's 35 pushing out, 20 to 26 trying to suck back in. So that will give us a filtration pressure of nine millimetres of mercury. And of course that's positive and that's going to cause the filtration of tissue fluid. Now actually there is a little bit of osmotic pressure in the tissue fluid. So uh, this figure would be slightly higher if we count the osmotic pressure in the tissue fluid because that would be tending to suck water out. But it's very small, so I'm not going to, not going to include it in the calculations. It gets a bit cluttered if you do that. So what we have is tissue fluid being formed at the arterial end of the capillary. So we now have tissue fluid. This of course is essential because it's the diffusional medium between the blood and the cells. The oxygen doesn't jump to the cells, the oxygen from the red cells goes to the tissue fluid before it goes into the cells. The carbon dioxide from the cells goes into the tissue fluid. As does everything else, as does the nutrients, as do the vitamins, as do the minerals, as do the waste products, they all diffuse through this medium of the tissue fluid. Now, as we go along, the pressure is going to drop. And here, the pressure has dropped to 16 millimetres of mercury. So I think you can see now that the hydrostatic pressure pushing out is 16 millimetres of mercury. But we've still got this 26 sucking back in. So that means we've got a reabsorption pressure of 10 millimetres of mercury. But this is pushing out and that is going back in. That's 10 millimetres going back in. So the suction effect of the plasma proteins has overcome the hydrostatic pressure within the capillary. So the tissue fluid is going to be reabsorbed. So as we noticed on the previous video, we have these processes of filtration and reabsorption. There's reabsorption there. And that's going to give us, this is what gives us the interstitial fluid.
fluid in the tissues as opposed to the fluid in here which was intra intravascular so the only difference <clears throat> between the fluids outside and the fluid inside essentially is the presence of these plasma proteins now if we added up the effect of the osmotic effect of the sodium and the potassium and all the ions this will give us an osmotic effect of thousands of millimeters of mercury but because they're the same on both sides that's pretty well cancelled out so we see the difference is the presence of the plasma proteins. So what we're actually talking about here is the, uh, the blood colloid osmotic pressure. So this is the blood colloid. A colloid is a uh, solution of water with big molecules in it. And the big molecules here are the um, plasma proteins. So what we sometimes call this is the oncotic pressure. So the oncotic pressure is the pressure generated by the plasma proteins. And because the other osmotic effects balance each other out across the capillary membrane, it's the oncotic pressure which is responsible for the reabsorption of the tissue fluid. So the hydrostatic pressure pushing out, the uh, oncotic pressure sucking back in. And um, about, of all the water going through here, of all the water going through in the blood, about uh, one part in 200 is filtered. And most of that is reabsorbed. The majority of that, maybe 85% of that is reabsorbed. It simply goes back in at the venous end of the capillary. And people have calculated that all over the body, maybe 20 litres a day of tissue fluid is formed. And about 17 of that is simply reabsorbed. It's simply reabsorbed. But of course that leaves another three litres or so that's not reabsorbed. Now, if that two to three litres was allowed to remain in the body tissues, pretty soon would suffer from edema, wouldn't we? The tissues would become edematous. In the UK, we spell that with an O. In the US. Logically, I must say, you, you don't have the O. Um, but we don't want that, it's a pathological situation. So as we've said, we've got the tissue cells here. There's tissue cells. But not all of the fluid is being reabsorbed and we don't want edema to develop. So what we actually have is there's another network of capillaries here. Again, with individual cells. Another network of capillaries. But these capillaries have sort of fairly floppy um, overlapping cells like this. And there's millions of these structures scattered throughout the, uh, well, all the tissues of the body with these floppy overlapping cells. And what these are, of course, are these are the lymphatic capillaries. They're lymphatic capillaries. Again, made up of individual cells. Unlike the blood capillaries, though, and unlike the vascular capillaries, the lymphatic capillaries are um, blind-ended. Now, what it means is excess fluid can come along here and because these cells are flappy, they will flap open and let the water in. But once the water's in, if the pressure increases, that will flap the lymphatic capillary cells shut. So they're acting a bit like valves. They're flapping open to let things in. 
and they're flapping close to keep it in. And then of course, once it's in, this will be transported away into larger lymphatic vessels, drained ultimately into the large lymphatic ducts that eventually drain back into the, um, near the subclavian, the subclavian veins. So there's this lymphatic system. Now, we mentioned that the proteins aren't supposed to escape, but sometimes they do. The odd one gets out. And if these were allowed to accumulate in the tissues, let me ask you, if these were allowed to accumulate in the tissues, what would that do to the osmotic pressure in the tissues? Well, I think you can see it would increase it. That would attract water and the tissues would be edematous, which would be bad. So again, these cells flop open to let the plasma proteins that have escaped in, and these are returned to the blood via the lymphatics via the entire lymphatic system, which there is a separate series of videos on, if you want to watch it. Um, and probably so two to three litres a day. So we've said 17 are reabsorbed back in. That would mean about three litres a day uh, is drained via the lymphatic system. So this absolutely vital interstitial fluid actually sometimes as well of course you can get uh, you could get bacteria in the tissues and they're also taken away by the lymphatic system that's why you can get swollen lymph nodes because these are going to drain via lymph nodes and occasionally unfortunately you can also get malignant cells in tissues I'm afraid these cells can go malignant and again these malignant cells can be taken away in the lymphatics which for a time can compartmentalize uh, malignant diseases. So fascinating area of physiology. Now, what we want to do next, I'm gonna leave that there for now. And next, we want to talk about the um, abnormal pathophysiology that can develop to alter this beautiful, intricate physiology, which is going on in you absolutely all the time.